Hello, I'm Tim Smith, pastor of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church in Fayetteville, Tennessee. And wherever you may be watching us from today, we're delighted to have you with us for this time of worship and study of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we continue to move past Easter, we are going to be looking at yet another of the recorded appearances of Jesus. This comes from John chapter 21, and it is the final story in John's Gospel, beginning in verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of the disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in, because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was in the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the lake. But the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. And may God bless the reading of his holy word and incline hearing to our hearts and our minds and its application to our lives this day. I think all of us are very familiar with the Last Supper. Certainly in the weeks leading up to Easter and Holy Week, we took some time to talk about some of the events in and around the Last Supper. It is one of the profound events of Scripture, and it is the climax of Jesus' teachings. However, today I want us to talk about what I'm going to call the Last Breakfast. This appearance on the Sea of Tiberias, where Jesus prepares a meal for his disciples. It is the final story in the Gospel of John, and it is rich with potential sermons and topics we could talk about. It begins simply enough with Peter, John, and five other disciples out fishing. They have fished all night, yet they have caught nothing. Finally, as light is beginning to break over the horizon, 
A figure from the beach calls out to them, Have you caught any fish? When their answer back is no, he tells them to put their net down on the right side of the boat. And they have a humongous catch of fish, don't they? So many fish that they are amazed that the net does not break. It is at some point during this that John is the first to realize it is indeed the risen Christ that is the figure calling for, to them from the shore. It may have been that now there was a little more light or they were a little closer to him, or maybe John just finally had it occur to him. But once John announces that he believes it to be the Lord, Peter jumps from the boat and swims and wades his way all the way to be the first to reach Jesus. It is at this point that the other disciples follow, and Jesus invites them to a meal that he has prepared, of fish and bread, which will be a breakfast. This begins an interesting time of teaching, no doubt, and I know that we would like to know more about what Jesus talked about and what he said and what he did in those moments. But as the breakfast concluded, a conversation between Peter and Jesus develops that I want us to really look at today. The first thing we notice in this is that they are indeed having this conversation. This is the first recorded conversation between Peter and the risen Lord. Now, we know that Jesus appeared to Peter sometime during the day on Easter. That's all we know about it. No more is said. We know Jesus appeared to the ten disciples, which included Peter, on Easter night. But there is no recorded conversation between Peter and Jesus. And then a week after Easter, Jesus appeared to the eleven disciples, which again, Peter was present, but they had no conversation that we know of. Here we see a very detailed conversation between Peter and Jesus and it is the first one they have had since the Last Supper. And I want to remind you what they talked about at the Last Supper. Jesus informed his disciples that the end was at hand, and that soon he would be taken away, that death was in the offing. Peter protested this and said, Lord, forbid it, and then went on to explain to Jesus that even if Jesus were arrested, even if Jesus were put to death, they would also have to put Peter to death. Peter says that his faith is so great that he will go with the Lord all the way unto the end. Jesus sort of busts his bubble, though, doesn't he? Or burst his bubble when he tells him, Before sunrise, you will deny me three times. We know the rest of the story. We know that on the night that Jesus was arrested and in the early morning hours of Good Friday, three times Peter was accused of being a follower of Jesus and all three times he denied it, saying he was not from Galilee and that he did not even know Jesus. Here, Jesus has an important question for Peter. He asked him, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these other six disciples? That's an odd question and a tough question at first glance. After all, how do we measure or even know how much someone else loves someone? How would I know how much you love Jesus or you know how much I love Jesus? And also, we would struggle to measure how much we love someone other than to say we love them a lot or we love them bunches, it's not a metric that can be measured in numbers. But if we remember back to the Last Supper, Peter, while he does not come out and say it, leaves the impression that he loves Jesus more than any of the other disciples. Now, he's humble enough not to say that directly, but he leaves that impression and goes on to say that he is willing to go all the way even to the cross himself with Jesus, which we know he actually was not willing to do when the rubber met the road. 
Now Jesus is asking him, do you love me more than these other disciples? Peter is much more humble in his answer, saying, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter seems to realize and no longer seems to try to make the case that he does indeed love Jesus more than the others, but only that the Lord knows that he loves him. Jesus replies to him that he should feed his lambs. Later in the conversation, Jesus again asks him, Do you love me? And a third time, Jesus asks him, Do you love me? We're told Peter was hurt by being asked three times if he loved Jesus or not, having answered all three times in the affirmative. But this serves as really a way of, as I saw a Sunday school lesson call it, reinstating Peter as a disciple and reinstating him to the ministry. After all, it was just a few days before that Peter had three times denied knowing Jesus or being associated with him. Now three times he affirms his love. And Jesus tells him to tend to his flock. This should stand as a reminder to us that no matter what mistakes we may make or no matter what may happen in our life, there is always another opportunity with Jesus. It would have seemed this was the end for Peter. After all, the, Jesus had said, you are the rock on which I will build my church. But now... As we read the gospel story, it sounds like Peter has gone astray as though he's resigned his position as a disciple when he denies knowing the Lord. But here he is reinstated. He is put back in a position of prominence among the disciples. And while his denial of Jesus is a painful moment, it is not the end of Peter that it seems it is. Jesus forgave him. And Jesus not only forgave him, but Allah was able to use him in a great way. Peter does continue to be a great leader in the church. He's very involved in the church in Jerusalem, the church in Rome. He is the first to take the gospel to the Gentiles. He plays a prominent role among the various disciples. He's restored to his position of leadership by Jesus. And this shows the level of forgiveness and grace of our Lord. The message is the same for us. No matter our past, no matter what mistakes we may have committed, no matter how bad we may have messed up or how much we disappointed the Lord, there is always another chance through Jesus. You may say, well, preacher, you don't know what all I've done. You don't know what all that I have been involved with. And I do not. I do not claim to know, nor do I need to know. You only need to know that Jesus loves, and the love and grace of Jesus is greater than any mistakes or flaws that we have made in the past. There is nothing that cannot be overcome through the power of Christ. There is absolutely no sin that is unforgivable with the exception of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And that simply means to refuse the call of the Holy Spirit to salvation. You have the opportunity today to respond to that call. You have the opportunity today to respond to the call of the Holy Spirit and accept Christ as your Lord. And in doing so, be given that clean slate and new opportunity. Peter struggles in this conversation, though, because he has no way to prove his love for Jesus. He can't cite the things he has done for Jesus because the most immediate thing that has happened is he has disappointed the Lord. He has failed and failed miserably very recently. And so he can't talk about, Jesus, you know I love you because I walked up Calvary's hill with you. Instead, he is struggling to be able to explain to Jesus how much he loves him. Finally, in the third answer, after, or after the third question, Peter answers by saying, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. 
Peter simply says, you know my heart, Jesus. You know that I love you. You know that I'm not perfect, but you know that I love you. That is really where all of us find ourselves. Because while we may not have denied knowing Jesus in his hour of need as Peter did, we have all disappointed the Lord at times. We've all sinned. We've all made mistakes. We've all asked forgiveness for something and then turned around and stumbled again before the day was done. We have all messed up. And any of us would have trouble proving to Jesus truly how much we love him. We would seem arrogant if we tried to cite examples of our love when in fact it is the love of Christ that is in abundance, not our love of him. We find ourselves where Peter is. Lord, you know my heart. We may not always live up to what our heart believes or what our intentions are, but you know that I love you. Jesus goes on to say that um, he wants Peter to tend to his sheep. He wants Peter to tend to his flock. And we see here that G Peter is being called by Jesus to be a shepherd of the church, to take care of his children, to take care of those that uh, are believers. We know that often the term of a shepherd is used to describe a pastor. And in the pastoral ministry, one is called upon to be a shepherd, try to protect one's flock from temptation, try to feed the flock spiritually, and help them to grow and mature in their relationship with God. But we also know that this does not just apply to pastors. This applies to all of us, as all of us are to be shepherds of one another. We are to care for one another and love our brothers and sisters and do our very best to help our brothers and sisters along life's way. That requires us to try to be a shepherd for our neighbor. It is not easy being a Christian. It is a tough challenge. It always has been. It was a tough challenge when Jesus walked upon the earth. It was a tough challenge when the apostles were preaching in the book of Acts, and it certainly is a tough challenge in this 21st century world with all the influence of the world and society. But John, I think, says it best in his epistle. He says to us that if we claim to be a Christian and do not love, we are a liar, and the truth is not in us, for God is love. And if God abides in us, we must love. We must love one another and encourage one another and help one another to live the Christian life. Peter was called to do this, and he fulfills that mission faithfully. He will spend many years in ministry, both in Jerusalem and especially later in the church in Rome. He starts churches. He converts believers. But Jesus tells him that he is to put his lambs before himself. He is to put others before him. For if we love Christ, we are to love other people more than we love ourselves. You know, it is easy to say that we love the Lord. I have been places where people would get up and testify in a testimonial service of how much they love the Lord. And they might go even into detail how much they love the Lord. And I don't doubt that they meant every word that they said. But it is one thing to say we love the Lord. It is another thing to truly live out loving the Lord. Jesus was calling Peter to live it out, to truly love the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that requires us not only to love God the Father and Jesus the Son and God the Holy Spirit, but calls upon us to love one another and to take care of one another. I'm reminded here that Jesus points out to Peter the death that he will suffer. And I'm reminded of the legend that is told of Peter. He was preaching in Rome in and around the year 67. We believe Paul was also there present in Rome when the persecution became great. 
Some there advised Peter that it would be wise to leave the city where there would be less persecution somewhere else, and he could continue his work in ministry and continue preaching and converting others. Peter leaves Rome and on his way out sees a vision of Jesus. He asks Jesus, where are you going, Lord? And Jesus replies to him, I am going to Rome to be crucified anew. Peter, convicted, no doubt remembered these instructions and what he had been told would happen to him at this final meal with the disciples. Peter turned around and went back into Rome, where shortly thereafter he was crucified, and the end of his earthly ministry took place. Peter fulfilled the responsibility of tending for his flock. He cared for his sheep. He went back to care for other believers, even to the point of risking his own life. That is how he showed his love for Jesus. The way we show our love for Jesus is our love for other people. And so let us love one another as Christ has loved us. The final statement that Jesus makes to Peter in this discussion, he simply says, follow me. If we look back in the Gospels earlier, we will see that when Peter and his brother Andrew were called to be disciples, Jesus said to them, Come, follow me. He is told to do the same thing again. And that statement is not just for Peter or the disciples or people in Bible times. It is the same for us. We are called to follow Jesus wherever it may lead us. For we know that Christ has great plans for all of us. And so I encourage us all to follow Jesus always. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we've had together in this day of life. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that he loved us enough to give his life for us so that we may have new life. Help us to love him fully and help us to love others as he has loved us. Forgive us of our sins and the times we have denied you, the times we failed you, the times we've messed up. But now we come to you to follow you. Take us and use us in the work of your kingdom. And in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Once again, I'm Tim Smith, the pastor here at the Cumberland Presbyterian Church in Fayetteville, Tennessee. We'd love to have you come worship with us in person. We're located at 1015 Lewisburg Highway, and we have two worship services on Sunday mornings. We have our traditional worship in the sanctuary at 1030, and at 830, we have our more contemporary worship service or casual worship service in the fellowship hall. And we'd love to have you come and be with us at either of those. May God bless you. Hope you have a wonderful week.